The time is now 1 o'clock Eastern. This is the official start for today's broadcast of the Excel Catlin and Sullivan Group webinar series. Today's topic is diagnostic error and malpractice. Dr. Tom Sizek is joining us today. He is the VP of eLearning Solutions for the Sullivan Group. Dr. Sizek has worked with the Sullivan Group for the last 14 years. He was first a client of TSG, and about a year ago, he joined as the VP of eLearning Solutions. I'm super excited to have Dr. Sizek here today, and especially talking about this topic, because he brings two super important perspectives. First, he served as the Chief Risk Officer for Premier Physician Services, and in that role, he was charged with all of risk management, and he was also the president of their own medical malpractice insurance company, so he's got that great risk manager perspective. He's also um, a practicing physician, and he lives in beautiful Colorado, which is where I also live. So um, with that, Dr. Sizek, I'm going to um, move to our agenda and hand you the controls. So ball is coming your way. Thank you for being here with us. And Great, the floor Jenna. Is yours. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Jenna. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. If there's any problem with sound or hearing me, please let us know. But I hope you all enjoyed a nice St. Patrick's Day yesterday, uh, whether you're Irish or not, everyone's Irish for a day. Uh, and the goal today is to improve your understanding of diagnostic error in 20 short minutes or less and its role in the malpractice claims. So I plan to do this by sharing with you about five pieces of information. What is diagnostic error? who makes these errors and where, why these errors occur, and how they can be prevented. And then once you're armed with this uh, understanding, I hope you can be part of the solution to help reduce medical errors and improve patient safety. That's our agenda for this morning. Diagnostic error is certainly a hot topic, as evidenced by this recent report from the Institute of Medicine, which, by the way, I just learned this morning the IOM has just changed its name to the Health and Medicine Division. So now we need to quit saying IOM and whip around the acronym HMD. Uh, I just found out this morning. Well, anyway, this report spends nearly 400 pages dedicated to the topic. And apparently, diagnostic error is very pervasive. And this report concludes that most people will experience at least one diagnostic error in their lifetime, at least one. The toll of diagnostic error is really great, not just on patients uh, and their safety, but it also drives up the cost of risk. As the report points out, kind of in the small print, their diagnostic errors uh, are the leading type of paid medical malpractice claims. Great report, read through at least the summary, a lot of good information there. So we're all speaking the same language. I thought I would start by defining diagnostic error for you. And this is taken from the report. It's a failure to do either one of two things. First, failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problems. So this is the classic misdiagnosis or failed diagnosis, or communicate that explanation to the patient. So failure to do either one of these is, is viewed as a diagnostic error. Uh, notice the growing focus on the role of the patient and their engagement, and not just on the practitioner. Well, we can think of medical errors as falling into two broad categories. This is nothing official. It's more my own type of division to help get you to understand where diagnostic errors really fit. The first category, errors of com commission, includes mistakes in which something was actively done wrong. Examples include procedures done on the wrong patient wrong site surgery, or even the wrong procedure on the right patient. So these are errors of commission. In contrast, in the second category, are errors of omission, which include medical mistakes in which something was not done, such as failure to do a blood test or x-ray, and this results in the failure to diagnose or delay in diagnosis. While there's certainly overlap and contribution by both types of errors, uh, we're really going to concern ourselves with category two or the second uh, category. Well, drilling down further to find out now where diagnostic errors occur, this data is from the Harvard Risk Management Foundation, CRICO, and reveals that the majority of diagnostic failures 
happen in the outpatient setting, more so than the errors in the inpatient and emergency department combined. Now, my understanding has always been that emergency department is technically ambulatory or outpatient, even though it's in the hospital, but nonetheless, this was their type of division. Coming down another level from ambulatory care, we see that the top three clinical areas involved in diagnostic error, cancer, heart disease, orthopedic injury. And again, while most, claim, most cases close without payment, as we know, it says they're 63% closed without payment, uh, it's interesting to note, 4% of claims were closed with payments over a million, and this percentage is rising. I bring that up because this may have major impact on healthcare systems, certainly insured physicians, since these payments can be in excess of policy limits. Uh, inpatient uh, arena and emergency department are certainly not immune to diagnostic errors. I think they're uh, a big cause of medical malpractice in the emergency department where, where I worked. Um, and, and actually in the inpatient side can tend to be a little more severe. But as far as frequency goes, uh, ambulatory care is where the money is. Okay, well, what specialties are involved? Let's, we're finding out who now in the ambulatory care uh, area. The Crico Harvard data shows us that half of the errors originate in the medical specialties, the medical specialties as opposed to surgical specialties. This is really not surprising. Think about the patients that come in to see family uh, physicians and internal medicine physicians. These physicians are highly involved in diagnostic process. Patients don't come in with a diagnosis. They arrive with a chief complaint. Something's wrong, a pain, a symptom, and they're counting on the medical system and their practitioner to, to get a diagnosis. Surgical specialties, in contrast, are more concerned with procedures, and while they do have their own share of diagnostic errors, they're less common. The bottom line for you is that as a risk manager, insurer, or whatever part you pay in healthcare, play in healthcare, if the majority of your healthcare service line or insured clients are medical, and in ambulatory care, the risk reduction focus really should be on preventing diagnostic errors. So a little bit further um, drill in the algorithm now. I mentioned earlier that the top three clinical errors involved in diagnostic error were cancer, heart disease, and orthopedic injury. This just provides a little more detail showing the actual types of cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal prostate. Again, from the viewpoint of patient safety, and loss prevention, efforts to reduce diagnostic care should really focus first if you have limited budget and really trying to target things on ambulatory care and the clinical areas of cancer and heart disease in particular. So emergency medicine is where I uh, spent uh, 33 years of, of my life and career uh, and uh, survived to tell about it. These two specialties have their own profile of missed and delayed diagnosis. These lists here are probably pretty familiar territory to most of you. This data shows the specific diagnoses that are frequently missed or delayed. No, no surprise, stroke, MI, uh, spinal epidural abscess up and coming. You can see that meningitis and appendicitis are on both, both lists. Well, what do these conditions on both lists, basically every list, have in common? They all present with a chief complaint. The patient doesn't come in and say, I think I'm having a spinal epidural abscess or a benign or malignant tumor. They come in with a chief complaint counting on the system to give them a diagnosis. So the complaints are things like weakness, chest pain, doc, I got a headache or fever rather than an obvious diagnosis. Second key feature that they share is that if there's a delay or failure to make the diagnosis, the end result is often permanent disability or death. Thus, they end up in the malpractice litigation arena. Okay, a little bit busy slide, uh, but bear with me while I camp here for just a, a few minutes. It's very important. This is the key, uh, I think. So now that we know what's a diagnostic error, who makes them, where in the system they're made, let's turn our attention to how and why questions. This is an elegant list from the Crico Harvard uh, system that breaks down the diagnostic process into the actual steps clinicians take in making a diagnosis. 
So just look at step one, it seems obvious, that patient will note a problem and, and seek some care. Step two, then the clinician forms a history and physical, moves on to step three, where they listen to, evaluate the symptoms and risk factors. Number four is forming a differential diagnosis. And then four steps involving diagnostic testing and going on to discharge follow-up and patient compliance. The reason these are important is that this is an interesting way to, a very fruitful way to analyze claims and errors. And you can actually see over in the third column where it says percent of cases, percent of cases that is claims that involved each of these uh, errors in each of these steps. And we can see the heavy hitters are evaluation of symptoms, uh, number three, listening to the patient and doing risk factors, number four, form a, forming a differential diagnosis in a third of the cases, and the other uh, areas of frequency. So it's not really required that each step be taken in order. You know, I'm letting you inside the mind of practitioners how they think, and then we're going to adapt this to how risk managers and insurance uh, professionals uh, can think in order to prevent. So we don't have to take these steps in order, but, and there's movement up and down. You get more information, you go back and do more tests. There's more symptoms, you go back through the list. So it's not so important to follow a sequential order as it is to know that each step is accompanied by its own potential for error. So error in any one of the 12 steps, and furthermore, the errors compound each other when they're taken as a whole. So let me give you an example, but this is not so abstract. Let's take a patient with chest pain. Knows they have a problem with chest pain, seeks care. We'll say emergency department or primary care. History and exam are performed, but if the symptoms and risk factors are not thoroughly evaluated, say for something like pulmonary embolism, well, then the differential diagnosis won't even include a pulmonary embolism, and as a result, the proper diagnostic test won't be ordered, much less interpreted or received and interpreted, and the correct diagnosis will be missed. So you can see how a, an error in one area can really compound. So it's within this framework that errors and claims can be analyzed for causes and trends and also uh, can be analyzed for potential solutions aimed at prevention. To be successful, if we're going to intervene to prevent diagnostic errors, the intervention has to include system solutions designed to change clinical behavior at almost every one of these steps. Okay, let's take a case history that resulted in not only diagnostic error, but unfortunately the patient's death, a claim, and settlement. Keep in mind the prior slide, the 12 steps of the diagnostic process, and in your own mind, track where mistakes were made early on in this case. This is a real case. 78-year-old man happens to come to the emergency department, says he's had abdominal pain and constipation for several days. The busy physician hears constipation, anchors on that, uh, focuses in on constipation, does a very cursory history and exam, asks that the patient be put in a back room uh, in the emergency department and given several enemas until he gets some results. Well, they were given and no results, and hours later the nurse drew the attention to the physician that the patient is getting much worse, nothing's happening, uh, and tests were finally ordered. Hours later, one of the tests was a CT showing diverticulitis with perforation. And in this particular event, uh, the liters of enema fluid went out through the perforation into the peritoneal cavity, and the patient died despite surgery. The attorneys in this case referred to it as death by enemas, uh, not in any laughing manner, but really uh, what happened. So uh, let's see here, I'll advance there. Try to advance. There we go. So this case did result in litigation. Uh, and here are the allegations taken verbatim from the plaintiff's complaint. So it's really no coincidence that these, very, these are verbatim allegations that match up with several of the steps in the diagnostic process. It's obvious that this plaintiff attorney, and in, in this case and in many cases, they're very aware of the process and potential for failures in these steps. Uh, it behooves us in our industry, healthcare and insurance, that we need to be equally, if not more, aware that failures in the diagnostic process are threats 
to the patient's safety and provide fertile ground for successful malpractice claims. The outcome was confidential settlement, somewhat hard to defend there. Uh, this, so we mentioned failure in the steps that are listed, uh, ordering diagnostic tests, misinterpretation of tests. These add up to account for 73% of the cases have lapses in clinical judgment. There are certainly patient factors to consider too, noncompliance for which really the, the healthcare institution and the practitioner could not be responsible, but also uh, the ever-present communication issue. So I'm just trying to frame kind of where these errors originate uh, and come from. But that didn't really answer the question, you know, that the why question, why are there clinical judgment problems and failures to diagnose? Are we dumb? Did we fall asleep in med school? Did we miss a quarter of instruction? Or there's some other common denominator? And I would submit, based on research and, and uh, my own observation of claims, that when we try to answer the question why there's lapses in judgment, literature shows that cognitive errors are involved in nearly every case. These statistics are from one study of emergency department claims from four different companies. Nearly every case involved an error in what the clinician was thinking rather than what they were doing on an individual level. So there's increasing recognition of the role that cognitive errors and biases play now, again, not to be too uh, obtuse, so let's use an example. A 65-year-old man complains of flank pain, comes in to the emergency department or any ambulatory care setting. The clinician hears flank pain and says, this looks like a kidney stone, walks like a kidney stone, acts like a kidney stone, except, oops, it's really a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. So cognitive errors are made in cases like that where they fixed on certain symptoms, prematurely closed the diagnostic process and uh, made the wrong diagnosis. To have any impact on these type of cognitive errors, again, risk management programs have to have tools that result in behavior changes by the clinicians. This is a list I took from the IOM report. Remember now that's the HMD, Health and Medicine Division. Report looking at cause of diagnostic care is really from a high level, more of a system level, 50,000 foot. Stresses problems with communication, communication uh, every which way, clinicians, patients, families, a healthcare work system that's not well designed to support the diagnostic process. Jargon for, well, let me give you an example of a well-designed system that will support the diagnostic process. And this would be like a breast diagnostic center. You go in, get a mammogram, the radiologist is there, they interpret it right away, they come in and talk to you, give you the reading, and if there are problems, uh, further tests are scheduled or done right then, biopsies and other care are scheduled with specialists who are right there. That's an example of a well-designed system that will support the diagnostic process. As clinicians, we don't get uh, adequate feedback about our performance. We don't know when errors occur because they don't all come back to us. And lastly, a culture that hopefully is changing that heretofore discouraged transparency and disclosure of diagnostic errors. So knowing that all diagnostic errors involve cognitive errors and lapses in judgment, we really need to come down from the high level, 30,000 foot down to the ground, and develop solutions that actually change clinical behavior, reduce diagnostic errors, and in turn, this will decrease the frequency of malpractice claims. So this graphic shows our own cycle of risk and safety, which is made up of three uh, simple, but I think elegant interventions. Number one is standardized education, online education for physicians, nurses, and practitioners, and our library currently consists of over 240 courses. Number two is clinical decision support. Let's give practitioners help at the point of care inside the electronic medical record, and third, a very important clinician assessment, uh, basically chart audits that measure clinical behaviors and provide feedback to the clinicians. We don't really know how we're doing until we get this kind of feedback. And this is a cycle because as we realize some of our behaviors may need changing, we need uh, improvement in knowledge and decision making, it can go back to the standardized uh, online education. So in my past role, as Jen mentioned, I was chief risk officer and president of our own MedMal company, 
uh, boy, those were nervous times being responsible for loss prevention and the claims and the operation of the MedMal Insurance Company for our group of over 700 practitioners. But it being in those roles, I can guess what you're thinking right now, and that is, you've heard some of this stuff before, and the legitimate question in your head, the million, multi-million dollar question is, right, Tom, does this type of patient safety program really work or not? So to answer this question, what we're looking at here is a sample claims data from one of our own large hospital clients, hospital system clients. They utilized our program, and still do, of online education and clinical assessment. You can see from the time period of 2001 to 2010, and these are emergency department claims, a subset, the frequency of claims in these high-risk areas dropped dramatically. Take acute coronary syndrome, 26 claims in 01 to four claims in 2010. And this is with no decline in patient volume, actually it was the increase in patient volume. Pulmonary embolism from three to zero, meningitis from 10 to zero, brain hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, 14 down to one, abdominal aortic aneurysm from 10 cases down to zero. So this is great news for patient safety, uh, great news for patient outcomes, reduction in diagnostic error, and this decline in claims was accompanied by reduction in reserves totaling many, many millions of dollars. The experience in my own group and our own insurance company was very similar. So I'll leave you with this summary. It's a, it's a short webinar, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we're already to the summary. Diagnostic error is a huge problem for patients, practitioners, and insurers alike. The frequency of these claims is highest in the ambulatory care arena, particularly in the medical specialties, but the inpatient arena and surgical specialties and emergency department are not immune. Diagnostic errors are a thinking thing rather than a doing thing. This is not wrong site surgery. This is not generally a procedure we've done. It's something we failed to do. And why? Because there are cognitive errors and biases uh, exerted by clinicians in nearly every case that need to be overcome. So to be successful in reducing these diagnostic errors and claims, all of us, clinicians, healthcare systems, and insurers, first have to be aware of the 12 key steps in the diagnostic process. Use that as a tool and how mistakes can be made at each stage. But I would submit that awareness is really only the first step. It's time to go way beyond that, and we need to follow with programs that include education, clinical decision support, and uh, really measurable improvements in clinical behaviors that we can feed back to the clinicians. So with that, uh, I'll give it back to Jen to open up the floor for questions. Thank you in advance for uh, attending, and uh, hope you all have a good weekend. But I'll turn it back to Jen now for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sizek, for sharing your, um, your expertise with us here during this broadcast. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for questions now. You can submit your questions using the WebEx chat. If you chat your questions to all panelists, those will come through to both um, myself and Dr. Sizek. You can also use the WebEx Q&A if that's more familiar to you. So we'll um, allow that, that chat queue to build a little bit. And, and while we're waiting for the queue to build up, I have a question for you, Dr. Sizek. So I, um, I hope go you don't mind it. that I get, I get to go first. So, um, you know, I've seen some literature recently about new statistics suggesting that only a handful of clinicians cause the most claims. And it made me wonder, you know, as it pertains to this subject of diagnostic error, what's your opinion on that being the case here too, that, that really these are just a few bad apples. This isn't a broad problem that we should be thinking about addressing on a broad scale. Oh, good question, Jen. And uh, you're referring to, I think, this recent New England Journal article that came out in January that uh, analyzed 10 years of claims uh, from the National Practitioner Data Bank. And their chief finding was that 1% of physicians accounted for 32% of paid claims. So you, you could really say this statistic suggests a bad apple theory. But there was an interesting comeback uh, put out by PIAA, and, and I uh, agree that there are certain concerns. There's other variables, so this is not the whole story. So the National Practitioner Data Bank, which was the data used for this claims information, it's only one source of claims data, and we all know that there are loopholes that allow paid claims not to be reported. So not poo-pooing the study, but there are other variables. And secondly, 
and PIA, PIAA points this out, some specialties are simply at higher risk. Neurosurgery and OB, for instance, as compared to dermatology, these specialties get sued more no matter what, negligent or not, because they're dealing with high-risk patients that have disabilities and deaths occur. So there's a mixed bag here. I, you know, my own personal experience is that, yes, you need to watch for trends, and when you see trends for practitioners that are either getting lots of complaints or multiple suits, you know, uh, underwriters certainly do this, and look at those objectively, see if there are trends that need intervention. Um, and so I think there's some truth to it, Jen, but there are other variables as well. Thank you for, for that and for not only acknowledging that it was the New England Journal of Medicine, but also um, recognizing that there was, you know, additional literature after the fact by PIAA. I think that's, um, thanks for summing that up so well for, for all of us here today. And I, I um, if anyone has any questions, again, please chat those. And in, in the meantime, if you don't mind, I might ask another one. <laughs> Uh-oh, go ahead. <laughs> so I've, um, I've heard folks say over time that, um, you know, diagnostic errors, again, it's just, it's kind of unavoidable. Um, and we just have to think about it as something we need to plan for as an, as an acceptable loss. And, and I know you and I have talked a little bit about that. Can you, you know, in our last minute or so here on our, our webinar, if you could comment for me about how, how do you feel about that? You know, coming from the perspective of the physician and also from the perspective of, of the, you know, risk manager. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever get to zero. Uh, I mean, you saw data from one of our healthcare clients, and again, in our own group, we were very happy just to reduce the frequency and severity as much as we could. I would love to see it get to zero and be, quote, diagnostic error-free from, uh, from the physician and practitioner side. On the risk manager or the uh, healthcare insurer side, you know, as healthcare systems um, acquire uh, more practices and employ more practitioners, they say there's good news and bad news. The good news is that, wow, we just hired 500 practitioners in multiple specialties and 26 different practices, or not hired, but uh, purchased and brought them on board as employees. Bad news is we have 500 new physicians in our system. What do we do? So rather than waiting for claims to hit the fan and being passive, I'd suggest that there's really several things you can do. One, use publicly available claims data, you know, from PIAA, CRICO, doctors, companies, any source that has public information you can Google. Identify and target the risks that are known in the specialties of your employed physicians. Second, as the groups are acquired and employed, Make it a habit to obtain the loss history for that group. Analyze those loss histories for trends, and uh, including the frequency and severity. You may see, wow, there's some, real, some things we really should uh, educate or intervene with. And in the last couple seconds here, I'll say a couple more things. One is review the complaint data. The complaint data, okay, and I don't mean legal complaints, but patient complaints for the physician groups in your, in your group practice. If it's available, because we know that patients sue physicians they don't like. So there is a correlation between patient satisfaction and uh, uh, malpractice suit frequency. Lastly, don't wait for claims to hit you. Use, my recommendation would be use or develop an assessment tool that measures the desired or best practice, clinical behaviors of your group, and um, institute that well in advance proactively. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much, Dr. Sizek, and for segueing so perfectly for me there. Um, so if any of you have any questions about some of the programs that Dr. Sizek touched on in terms of the education or the assessment, um, please contact Brant Ross at the Sullivan Group for information about those programs. If you have any questions about the XL Catlin TSG partnership, please contact your Bermuda brokers. And um, Again, in conclusion, we will have a general evaluation link that'll pop up once the event ends. We'd love to hear from you. And we are gonna archive today's broadcast on our YouTube channel, so please look for an update from us on that. And thank you all so very, very much for joining us here today. Um, this concludes our broadcast. Thank you, everyone.